All right, thank you very much, Ellison. If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 9, we're in our uh, series on the 12 apostles, and this is number 7 or 8, depending on the listing. Those first, uh, first five are always listed in the same order, and then, yeah, and kids can go. I just don't like them to leave, that's all. Kids can make their way to children's church if you want, that's okay. Um, these apostles, the rest of them are not always in this order, including Matthew. You'd think he'd be up high on the list. He's seventh or eighth listed. And in Matthew 9 is where we're going to be mostly. It's the longest text that we have about him, as well as we have his gospel account. Matthew is long. So you can figure out a lot about him based on what he says, how he says it. And so we're going to look a bit at that as well. Matthew has as a, a symbol. Remember we've talked about every apostle has a symbol, something that's usually painted or sculpted with him to designate something very specific. Because all of the paintings of the past and sculptures of the past were actually done in order to teach. Today, it's not. We have so much teaching available. We could read anything we want and study anything we want. But back in the day, there's uh, high literacy, uh, illiteracy. There was n not a Bible in homes. So they literally, these cathedrals were created in a way to bring an awe and sense of God and to teach. And so very often, Matthew, which is unique to the apostles, had a little character, a little person. So we do have um, one which is kind of famous that we could maybe bring up onto the screen. And if you look at what some of them are, if you remember Andrew was an, um, Andrew was an, uh, was an ex, and that's how he was crucified. Peter had keys. You can see stories behind some of these. And this one, this one's pretty typical. This is a little, uh, often even an angel character uh, staring up at Matthew. This is, this is pretty normal. If you get the Wednesday devotional, you'll see a little bit more behind the story of this particular painting because there is a story behind it as well but it's a person. There's the ultimate key meaning for the person, and whether that angel is off to the side or wherever, there's usually this little person, and it is probably because of his genealogy in the first chapters of Matthew. That's probably the reason. He was the one, Matthew was the one that charted the human side of the descendants of, um, of Jesus. And so forever, that's kind of what he's known for. It's a beautiful display. It's that section that you and I read and we kind of skip past because we're like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And a name will pop out that you know, and you're like, oh, I know. And then the others, you don't. And you're like, I don't know why. Well, they're very important because it's showing the historicity of the text as well as of Jesus. The lineage of Jesus was and is very important, and the lineage of Jesus presented in the New Testament, we owe it to Matthew. Hence, that little face, that little person, little human being. What would be in your painting? Think about that. What would be in your painting? Now, very important to separate the negative. Separate that. All of the apostles had something, most of them had something pretty negative that really they're known for. I mean, for poor Thomas, we think it's his last name because we think his first name is Doubting. So it could be a a painting like he's the Riddler with a big question mark or something. No, we all have the negative. Set aside the negative. The divorce or divorces, uh, the alcoholism, uh, jail time, drugs. Set all of that aside. 
We have the negative. What's the positive trait that you would be painted with? I remember asking the kids this years ago, we would just have it like at a Sunday lunch or something, the kids just never know what they're going to say. Uh, summer intern Ross was the least, uh, no, he was the second least um, unpredictable. Grant would never have anything to say, uh, the moral compass. Emma, you don't know what she's going to say, so she real quick, I said, hey, there's a portrait of me, what's it going to be? And she's like, oh, I want to answer, Bible in one hand and like a bag of chips in the other. And I'm like, okay, actually, I don't mind that. That's not bad. But what would be the symbol that would represent you? What we're talking about is your legacy. What is your legacy? It's also important to note that no matter the age, it can still be defined. It can still be sought after. What is the legacy? What is it that would be painted with you? Uh, Judas is always painted with a bag of money. That was it. I mean, he finished, and that's, unfortunately, that was the biggest thing. Remember Philip? Philip was the one that had the inquisitive conversation on the fish and loaves, and he became known for that. And so usually, if you see an apostle, you're not going to recognize him, but you'll see the loaves, and you're like, oh, that's, that's Philip. Remember last week, Bartholomew? That's when you don't want. When you have a knife in one hand and you have your skin that's been flayed laying over your leg, John, a chalice because of his suffering. Peter, keys, keys to the kingdom. What would be your legacy? Father, I think we can admit to you as a family that we, we live day to day. And we take things that happen, move along with current it would pray that you would continually strengthen us to an end, that there's a purpose and a unique skill and a unique ability, gift that you've given each of us for us to use to your end, and maybe as a legacy. So give us insight, we pray, into this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have a Bible there? It's Matthew 9. Uh, Matthew 9. And again, interesting that we have a calling of Matthew, and we're already in chapter 9. So a lot's already taken place. But in 9, starting in verse 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed. And as Jesus reclined at the table at the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, hey, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. First take note, this is Matthew telling the story. That's, that's worth noting. Matthew's the one referring to the low quality of life that a tax collector is. It's not a tax man. We all need tax people, people who prepare your taxes. That's very different than this particular position. If you're brave enough to use just the old King James, it was the only one, the last one that used the word publican that is actually from the era. That's actually what it was called. It translated correctly. It's a publican. But nobody knows what a publican is today. So that's not it. It's a, it's a position. 
And then most now today, if you in your Bible, it probably said tax collector, probably. That's it. Nailed it. Publican means it was a position. So this is actually a position from Rome to collect taxes. Not necessarily popular. Because that's they just weren't honest. We had two big problems. You're working for Rome. Strike one. Like, we hate this oppression that we're getting from Rome, and you're collecting money. And secondly, they don't do it honestly. He's a publican. Calling himself one who is, as it says here in his own text, setting with tax collectors and sinners. Like, I can't get any worse than this. Listen, he's not proud of it. You look in the other books of the of Gospels, none are more clear on what he did than he is. I think that's fascinating. They'll mention tax collector, but there are none that are really saying it as often and as clearly as Matthew himself. That's interesting. If I were his friend, if I were one of the other, I was a fisherman, I'd be the one to point out that he was a tax collector because I don't even like him. They didn't mention it, just in passing. But he leaned into it. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us he's not bragging about his past, but he's also not ignoring it. It is what it is. Your past is what it is. And the rest of us aren't thinking about it hardly as much as you are. They didn't even mention it. That's how much they weren't thinking about it. I mean, he wasn't that guy. You've heard those testimonies, the, the guy that says, oh, I was, you know, I was in drugs, and I was married three times, and I spent time in jail, but then at the age of 12, I gave my heart to Jesus. And you're like, Wow. That was some rough elementary years you had there, son. That was amazing because they're so proud of it. They're just like, I love to tell the story. That's not Matthew. Matthew isn't glorying in it, but Matthew is saying it. He is the one of the least likely people you would pick to be one of the elite 12. There's, there's the point. What disqualifies us? What disqualifies us is that we haven't been washed in the cleanliness and the forgiveness of Jesus. That's it. What you've done before doesn't matter. I think a a strategy of Satan is to convince a believer in Jesus Christ that you're on plan B in your life because you squandered plan A. I did this, I participated in, and it's just, it was so bad, so it's okay, he loves me, and I'm on to a different path, and he'll bless me and be kind, but it's plan B or plan C. That is absolutely a lie of Satan. That's not true. If you find yourself middle of the night meandering through parts of Pittsburgh that you shouldn't be in. Like we do in life, we find ourselves in places that we probably shouldn't have been. The day you slide over and let him drive is the day that you're on plan A. Yeah, but look at all that. No, he's driving. You don't get any better than that. And because he is sovereign, big theological word for us, because he is sovereign, he has allowed the things to take place to get you to where you are. I have a friend that went to Grove City many, many years ago, lives in North Carolina now. When I first met him, he had 
basically just come to know the Lord, and I'll tell you the stories. I didn't believe half of them. I have since verified them. He was married three times. He, had, he was an airline pilot and lost it because of some drug use. I mean, the stories. And finally one day, we're good friends, and I said, okay, go back. What would you change? Just name one thing, the biggest thing. He quickly, he goes, none of it because it took that to get me to where I am today. I trust God with all of that. It's plan A. But it's hard to convince us of that for ourselves and for the one that you know. You're like, oh yeah, they did too much. Really? There was a too much? The more sin, the more grace. The more sin, the more forgiveness. The darker your past, the brighter Jesus can shine. You're an amazing story of what God's done, and you're on plan A when you have moved over and allowed him to drive. That's the first point was that Matthew was was a colorful shade of bad. The second one is Matthew brought his unique skill set to Jesus. Think about this for a minute. So when we come to know Jesus, yes, all the bad is past. Everything's new. But there's skill sets that you had that you may have been misusing that are now available for his use. That's true of Matthew. Matthew had a remarkable skill set. Out of the four gospel accounts, the one that is the most particular. In fact, his layout of genealogy, I believe it's three sets of 14. It's very meticulous, kind of, kind of like an accountant. Yeah, because that was his skill. He had the columns going. He knew. He knew numbers. That's what they did. I mean, that's what he literally would poke through bags and find things that were purchased outside of the country. He'd tax them, 2 to 12%. He'd send what was needed to Rome, but then he just kept whatever extra he wanted to keep. That's, that's how they played it. And he was very meticulous. It's interesting. That's what he did. He had a bad trade, but a remarkable skill set. I remember uh, once, um, Lori's from Cottonwood, the auditorium there up in, I called it Cotton Tucky, up in Cottonwood. Beautiful auditorium. It was a real small town, and it was, um, uh, the auditorium sat 13, uh, 1,100. In fact, it's funny. Fun fact, it had... Um, basically 700 seats on the floor and 400 up top. That's what I would always say. But it wasn't. It was 666 seats below. Is that awesome? So I went there, and they told me, they were like, oh, yeah, there's 666 on the floor. I said, oh, I know. I've looked out. I've seen them. And they went, no, the chairs. And I went, oh, right, the chairs. I said, it bothers you? Yeah, a little bit. I said, well, you know, you can take a chair out. They said, well, it needs to be symmetrical. You know, you could take two chairs out. I mean, this wasn't very hard. So one Sunday, I noticed, and it was kind of as everyone was coming in, there were, there were two, uh, like, fourth, fifth graders in the balcony with a fishing pole. Well, that caught my attention. And I'm just, I'm, look, I'm like, what is going on? And I'm way off to the side, and I'm watching. They had this little fuzzy thing on the end of it, and they were dropping it in old lady's hair. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, oh, no. And they drop it, and the lady's like, oh, what's that? And they reel it back up, and they're giggling, and they're dropping it again. So I went up there, and I said, they saw me, and they're just horrified, like, like they got caught. And I went, guys, guys, bad idea. And I stopped. I went, no, great idea. Right? I mean, that's a great idea. Like, they, pl- they planned it. They brought a fishing pole to church. That's how much they planned. I'm like, okay, no, no, no. I meant, I mean, guys, this is awesome. Great idea. But no, you can't. They're like, oh, no, we'll take. We'll, we'll, they had a little fishing box. They had different uh, lures depending on which old lady they wanted to get. I mean, you know, they had it all planned. Bad idea. 
clever, bad application. This is tough to think about. This is very abstract. In the world, we have skill sets that can be used for the wrong things. We have skill sets that actually we use for self-gain, self-satisfaction. That skill set is to be used for the Lord. I think of that with musicians all the time, some great musicians out there, secular, amazing voice. Oh, they don't do any harm. You know, they're good people. No, God-given talent and ability that is spectacular that's being used 100% for self-gain. That's what's going on. Use that for the Lord. Charles Colson, great example of that. Attorney, special counsel for Nixon, the mastermind behind Watergate. I mean, right? What do they call him? The axe man? He was rough. He's the guy you want to get something done. Spends time in federal jail. In fact, if you look at the story, he could have gotten out of that, but he fessed up to some things because of his newfound relationship with Jesus. He spends time actually in uh, Maxwell, Alabama, a federal uh, prison, comes out, right? You know the end of the story. Besides Breaking Point, which some of you read or listen to, besides Breaking Point, bigger than that, starts the greatest, largest prison ministry in the history of the world, prison fellowship. Do you see what he did? He was using his talents and abilities for selfish reasons or for wrong reasons, has this reprieve, this I came to know Jesus, and now don't change who you are because you're amazing. Apply it in a different place. Okay, so us. What about us? You have great skill set. Making good money. I mean, it's, and it's good for the company. You should. You're, you're doing good. Are we using our skill set for kingdom work also? What are we doing to contribute? We so much think that the Christian life is so that I can live a good life and honorable to God and just be faithful in His. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Keep going. So that you can participate in seeing people come to know Christ and discipled in their faith. That's what we're called to do. We're in a weird culture and day today. Did you see the Last Supper at the opening ceremony? This is non apologetic. It is a group of 12, 13 drag queens mocking the Last Supper on an international stage. And the president of France comes out and says how proud he is of all of that. This is bad. We're in a tough time. One sponsor for the Olympics so far has pulled out. One sponsor pulled out and said, nope, I'm not going to play. I'm not participating. Read the articles. Oh, read the articles that who's, it's the ultra-conservative didn't like it. Really? Is that, what, is that who didn't like it? Is it a little broader than that? Liberals didn't like it who know Jesus. It's the Christian community. We're in a really difficult day, and we sit back and we're using our skills and abilities. Good, we should. Use it for uh, providing for our family and using it to do whatever we That's all fantastic, but not without a view to know that we are in a very difficult time in this world. God has gifted you, and you have skills and abilities that can be used for kingdom work. Because there's a battle going on, whether or not we want to act like there's a battle going on or not. There's a battle going on, and it's for the hearts and minds of our own children. And Matthew changed gears. This is unique. 
He's, he's one of the elite 12. This is unique. It doesn't mean you leave your job, although probably there are some that need to stand up and go, you know what? I have skills and abilities that nonprofits can use, that churches can use, and I can be on the front line. Yep, maybe so. And maybe it's time. But if we can't define, this is what I do for God. This is my calling. The Bible tells us plainly that he has good works prepared in advance for you to do. He has them. He knows what they are. Do we know what they are, and are we doing them? Doesn't have to be starting the largest prison ministry in the world. Probably won't end up in a newsletter somewhere. But you know what your calling is. And I think so many of you do. You know what God's called you to do. And you put your efforts and energies that way. Third point, really quick here. So he brought his unique ability and skill set to the Lord. He also brought his unique friends to Jesus. And I see that in the passage because he specifically called Matthew. This is verse 9 of Matthew 9. He passed on. This is in Capernaum. Matthew, sitting at the tax booth, hey, follow me. He actually got up and followed him. But then Jesus reclined at the table in the house. Many tax collectors and sinners came reclining with Jesus. You know, Matthew brought his friends have you heard of that, that, that you're unique in your friends? Have you heard friends? F-R-A-N-S. It's how, if you were raised in the public school system in northern Ohio, that's how you would spell friend, Fran. But it's actually on purpose, F-R-A-N. It's friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Think of those circle. Nobody has a set of friends like you do. Nobody does. Your set of friends, your relatives, glad they're yours, by the way, your associates and your neighbors are unique to you. So put yourself in the center of these circles. Friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Nobody has them but you. We overlap, which is important, because you're working on a neighbor. You've been working on a neighbor a long time. You've done what you can do. And you're like, I don't know if I'm getting anywhere. Well, no, it's your neighbor, but it's somebody else's associate. They're working on them, and you don't know it. See how that overlaps? He brought his friends to Jesus. Our first house was at 49th Avenue and Thunderbird, actually right on the edge of Glendale in Phoenix, a little townhouse. We love that townhouse. And our neighbor, a uh, couple, she looked like Whitney Houston. She was just beautiful. And her husband was the coolest guy as well. And we are starting to talk to him a little bit. And there's still a phrase that uh, he has said to us that we still repeat in our family. Um, summer intern Ross, I don't know if you know this phrase. One Christmas I saw him and I just said, Merry Christmas, and he said, back at ya. I'm like, that is the coolest thing ever. I didn't know you can just back at ya. Hey, good morning, back at ya. So that's where, if we ever hear us as a family, we ever say that, they're like, oh, hey, good morning, back at ya. And just my, my level of cool, that was it. And I remember uh, we were chatting, and we invited him to uh, a program at the church. It was beautiful, Christmas program, whatever. He came, they came, they had a decent time, I think, and, uh, and they, they left. And then another short day, a couple days later, this older gal comes out of her townhouse, and I was out doing something, and she looked over and she goes, are you the reverend? And I went, maybe. Like, you know, it depends. <laughs> I'm not going to say yes if she wants to hurt me. And I'm like, maybe. She goes, you are, aren't you? I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And she, uh, it was his mom 
visiting from Maryland all the way to Phoenix. And she came over, neatest lady, and she goes, you're getting to him. And I went, what do you mean? You're sharing the gospel. I've been praying for him his whole life. He's listening to you. And right when she said that, he came out. And then she's like, so anyway, nice to see you, Reverend. And off she went. And I'm like, I wonder how many times that happens. You're being bold. It's a cold contact. You're just being friendly. Invited him to church. Invited him to Bible study. Shared the Lord with him. And you're like, it's just a cold call. It's never a cold call, ever. There's somebody, there's a grandma praying somewhere for that kid. You just never get to see it. And Matthew was able to bring his closest associates. So what's your legacy? What's being painted? We know what Carnegie's legacy is, right? 3,000 libraries. Do you know that? I mean, it's so much that younger people, Carnegie is a library. <laughs> they didn't even know it was a person. Laterno. Laterno invented all the large earth moving equipment. In fact, this is what he said. He goes, I shovel out the money. He gave 90% of everything he made to nonprofits and churches, 90%. He says, I shovel out a lot of money and God shovels it back to me, and his shovel is bigger. (laughs) Isn't that great? That was his calling. That was it. He goes, that's what I do. I just give. I just give money. I don't know what your legacy is. What is it you're called to do? God has you on plan A. In faith in Jesus Christ, you're plan A. The past, we all have it. There's all something. It's okay. Give it to the Lord. Plan A, what's your calling? What's your legacy? Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Matthew and his, the little bit that we know about him personally. I do pray that you would help us all have our own legacy in following after you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.